So, good evening, every, everyone. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, today, I will speak about animal taste, belief narratives, and COVID-19 in Argentinian folklore. It was a research I began uh, long ago, and it was um, the first results have been published in a book. And the, this uh, research has been a pretext to give to, um, for my students who um, made a, an audiovisual presentation that we are going to see a little fragment uh, about um, COVID-19. So let's uh, reflect about folk tales and belief narratives and initial approach. Next, please. Uh, so, um, understanding folklore as a sum of traditional expressions of knowledge operating within a community, comprising an embodiment of social beliefs, as our Abraham says, we are focusing the, um, the attention on folk narratives as several expressions of social identity and uh, on legends that, uh, which as the Wim says, are folk tales historically grounded, and uh, as uh, Linda Dex says, legend, uh, speaking about legend, legend and belief is a pleonasm, since uh, all legend uh, um, deals with beliefs. So I understand belief uh, with Gray Mass and Cortez, um, the Dictionary of Semiotics, as a modal expression of certain, certainty whose true value depends on a subjective or entire subjective agreement. So the belief narratives explore the boundaries of historical experience with the cognitive modality of belief as model expression in which the, in which the true value of a discourse depends on social consensus. And there is also always a quest of believability supported by argumentative strat strategies oriented to make the discourse acceptable as possible. So uh, I will deal with belief narratives as alternative itineraries of factors and the same under the same matrix and to reflect in, um, about this concept of matrix I will deal with in a minute. So, animal tales, uh, the one of animal tales is a folk narrative genre that reflects the atmosphere of daily life through the humanization of the vernacular fauna, as Kovacci says, and uh, the protagonists are personified animals uh, who, who, because I personified, who carry out a series of action articulated in sequences, which take, take place in a fictional world. Each version is organized according to thematic, structural, and stylistic patterns or matrices stabilized in the dichronic di di transmission process, which includes scriptural recreations. Today, I won't uh, deal with scriptural recreations, uh, but uh, it is worth uh, remembering that in Argentinian folklore, there are a lot of scriptural recreations. Um, but today, I will deal with oral versions only. Um, these alternative versions of narrative matrix are transformation uh, and with a transformation connected with local beliefs uh, by means of changing details. This is what I will um, uh, deal with today. Animal tales, um, as me, um, the, uh, I will deal with animal tales, pointing out the mixture of, gen of genres, the folk tale and legends in a polyphonic message. So. Let's go to uh, reflect about the um, relevance of details, matrices, hypertext, and social beliefs. Uh, as I afford, as I said, for matrix of narrative patterns, which combine thematic features, structural and stylistic ones, identify that intertextual comparison of versions. So the folk tale genesis deals with the transformation of these matrices in different cultural environments by additions, suppression, substitution of displacement of changing details. And uh, as Mukhalovsky uh, points out, details are, can be understood as the basic semantic units in folk art and as mnemonic tracks which activated these matrices. The itineraries of the folk matrices are flexible and reproduce the flexible connection of memory, similar to the disseminative structure of a hypertext. I understand hypertext with Nelson as a flexible combination of textual blocks freely set by the user of an informatic system. From informatics, Nelson um, uses this concept. And instead of an informatic system reproducing the um, 
the flexible connections of memory. I make an analogy between the flexible structure of the photon and the one of a hypertext. Uh, with Eastern formation of thematic topics as the one uh, uh, once listed in the ATU uh, index of um, tail types. And um, I um, add to this the structural patterns, the, the um, sequences, these flexible sequences and the rhetoric stra strategies, uh, which are with, uh, transformed by means of the influence of social beliefs bound to vernacular context. So let's reflect about rhetoric of believing. Rhetoric is the art of persuasion whose aim is not to reason, but to convince appealing to belief, as Aristotle points out. I understand the narrative with Brunner as a cognitive principle which organizes experience in a sequential way and which provides structural patterns to articulate social beliefs. So uh, in the, the, um, uh, the true value of the narrative construction of beliefs depends on a collective agreement. And I will um, deal as well in this uh, presentation with the argumentative use of metaphors as not only as figures of language, but also as cognitive issues condensating multiple meanings and um, underlining that belief narratives go beyond the borders of epistemic knowledge towards ontological arenas of belief. So let's reflect about believing and the quest of truth in the belief narrative, there's, there's always a quest of believability supported by argumentative strategies based on modal affirmation. And belief narratives such as myth are experienced as real, as Anna and Lina Sikala says. And I will, mm, uh, uh, it's worth remembering the poetic of history as white uh, studies with this fictional elaboration of poetic elaboration of reality in a dynamic tension with the illusion of reality of fiction pointed out by Bart. In Argentinian folk text, there is also always an um, interweaving of fiction and reality, opening the boundaries of folk genres uh, such as American towards a fantastic and legendary discourse. Uh, not only in Argentinian folk toys, but I will um, focus my attention in Argentinian folk, folk, or, uh, folk toys. It's worth uh, remembering that in Argentina, in the Argentinian folk narrative, we don't have fairies, so animals um, uh, cover um, the role of fairies and other um, uh, mythical beings uh, as well. But uh, for instance, as um, uh, dwarfs, as um, goblins and, and other um, mythical creatures. So uh, there is, uh, um, uh, summing up, there's uh, this intertwining between uh, of folklore genres, uh, folklore genres uh, animal tales of belief narratives, uh, um, and there's uh, um, understood as narrative expression of the differentiation identity of local groups with a vernacular worldview which mixes up his panic and migration culture with indigenous culture in a sort of Creole culture. Uh, and the, it, it, um, it, uh, it can be mirrored in the um, uh, texture of the folk tales that we deal with. So let's speak about the Argentinian contextual variants of animal tales. Refreshing first that animal tales are a distinctive expression of cultures whose, whose origin is as back, uh, um, uh, can be, um, go as far back as the humanity, whose protagonists are personified animals uh, uh, who, as a Ford said, carry out action articulated in sequences in a fictional world. And they, uh, in the Argentinian um, folk tales, are um, um, animals of the vernacular fauna. The dominant recordatory strategy as a force is a personification. And let's say that uh, refresh this intercultural crossroad between Eastern and Western tradition from Greco Roman uh, culture to Christianity. And this mixing up with uh, Eastern traditions, let's say that if uh, um, to Argentina uh, arrived the Spanish conquerors, but uh, there has been the um, uh, Arabic um, um, invasion to Spain. So um, the, the um, Eastern cultures uh, is as well reflected in Argentina. Uh, 
first uh, through the Spaniards and also be with the new waves of migration, uh, for instance, in the Argentinian Northwest, I will focus the attention in uh, Northwestern Argentinian folk tales, so uh, where the Eastern culture is uh, present as well. So these are intertwining the um, meeting European indigenous agriculture with uh, variants expressed in a local uh, worldview. The main protagonist of Argentinian narrative is the fox, not the wolf or not the jackal as in European cultures, but the fox and the armadillo called Kirkincho. So we have two main cycles, one in which the fox as the bigger animal uh, defeats the, uh, is defeated by the local armadillo, who is, uh, you can see here the armadillo, who is uh, a smaller and clever, uh, more clever than the fox? But in the other um, series, the the enemy of the fox is the tiger, and the cunning fox um, uh, manages to uh, outwit the um, the tiger or other animals or even the man. Uh, so we will focus the attention today. I will focus the attention today in the fox as the clever animal who defeats other ones or uh, even men. In the Hispanic tradition, the fox is called John, the wife is called Jane and the children Johnny. So let, we will speak about John the fox. So I will focus the attention in the uh, repertoire of uh, this folk narrator, Amalia Vargas, from the Quechua culture from the Chipcha nation of the Argentinian Northwest in the limit with Bolivia and uh, whose repertoire told by her mother comprises two main folk tales I will, I will deal with today, the fox and the magic pot and the donkey that who or that shit silver, who because he is personified. And as in third says, I will deal with the fox as the first of the animal by Horacio Castro for the Umawaka culture in the, the same zone as Amalia Vargas and the Salamanca by Marino Cordova, also of the Western Argentinian province of La Rioja. And I will um, point out the relevance of these changing details um, in the Argentinian social context in which struggle for survival in a difficult environment is the dominant topic. And I will point out the poetic word, the, the hallmark of this individual narrator uh, whose uh, distinctive feature is the performance, the body performance, the corporal performance in this um, uh, in this forte. So let's go to the first one, which is the fox and the magic pot. The next, uh, please. The fox and the magic um, pot. Uh, she presents uh, herself as Amalia Vargas. I am Quechua from the Chipcha nation, from the border with Bolivia, from the mountains. I am going to tell you the story my mom told me. The protagonist is John the fox and he's uh, one of the most mischievous animals, right? He's a trickster. He's one who always mock, makes fun of the people. Hey, my mom says that in the past, the fox was always dressed in brown and that he was always wearing a brown scarf and a little brown hat. We have here social beliefs, collective belief between this um, uh, relationship between animals and men and this anthropomorphic um, transformation of the fox. So you, because once upon a time, in past times, some people were men during the day, both, but in the evening and in the night, they became animals. So the fox was a man whose job was to be a salesman. He sold of kind of stuff, right? For instance, he sold pots. And then uh, Amalia Vargas uh, tells this um, aversion dealing with um, the fox and the magic pot, which is, um, um, a, a, an alternative itinerary of 18 number 1539, Puerla and Willibility, uh, in which um, the fox uh, it intends to um, mock on the people, selling this magic pot, he takes it, he, it to the fair, and uh, Amalia points out that the fairs are very common in her culture, in indigenous, as a sort of indigenous markets. In, uh, to which the, um, uh, the fox 
uh, took this pot and he made a hole um, uh, beneath the soil and hid the embers and then poured water um, in the, into the pot and then uh, he pretended that the, this pot was self-boiling and he, 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 sold, he sold it uh, to a man. And when the man uh, took this uh, pot to his house, after having paid a lot of money, he realizes that this pot uh, doesn't uh, boil by itself. So the possessor is always tricked. So, uh, but it, it, um, Amalia finishes this, um, this tale saying that was the mockery the fox did that right, since he was a person during the day, a person who made fun of the people, selling those things right, mocking at the people. And that was the people that the people could realize that it was a fox because he was always wearing his brown scarf. So let's go to the matrix as a foresight. Um, the dramatic topics is ATU and AT 1539. They, they all use uh, self magic ob uh, object and animals, the self cooking pots, and so some mo motif K, uh, K uh, 112.1, uh, a, a pot that cooks by itself. Let's point out that in Argentinian folk choice, um, in, in, are more likely to be similar to Arne Thompson's uh, classification than uh, to ATU, because uh, perhaps because uh, Thompson was American, I don't know. But uh, I, since uh, Arne Thompson is um, more synthetic, perhaps this is the uh, the reason why um, the, the the thematic description is more likely to be similar to uh, Arne Thompson. The composite structure has one micro sequences, could, which could be divided into sequences, selling the pot and discovering the trick. And the rhetoric structure is a personification of uh, the main rhetoric uh, strategy is a personification of animals, in which Fox is the metaphor of the worldview of Quechua culture and a parody of the fa magic function, because uh, Amalia says that uh, in order to for the pot to boil, they, they had to pronounce a sort of charm, which was irbioshita, kirpioshita, uh, that's to say, uh, boil little pot, kirpe, it's saying in Quechua language, um, uh, also boil this reduplication, say in Spanish, both in Spanish and in Quechua. And it's a sort of a parody of a magic taste in which these, there, these magic objects have magic properties. So um, let's go to the intertext. I made an intertextual comparison of this um, of this text with one by Horacio Castro, which um, the one by Amalia Vargas I collected it. I recorded in March um, the 20, uh, 20, uh, 2020. And so uh, this one was in um, uh, 2002, that's to say in 2002. Uh, it was Horacio Castro is from, as I, uh, as I said, from the Omawaka culture and he tells this tale. I'll tell you what happened long ago in times of the creator of everything, the female goddess, the Pachamama. It is said that long, long time ago, the Pachamama created everything. She created the sun with the fire she took from inside her. She created the stars and the moon and the snow on the hills. She created the water, she created everything and she created all the animals in the beginning. And the cutest, the dominant animal was the fox and all the other animals were smaller than him. So, well, so the Pachamama decided to give the, to the other animals some of the attributes that the fox had more than enough because the fox was the only to fly, the only to swim, the only to run. In this way, birds began to fly, fishes began to swim and so on. The fox was still the first of the animal because he preserved his intelligence, but at last the Pachamama restricted this privilege of the fox and gave a part of, uh, of it to the last one, an ugly monkey, which turned out to be the man. 
Since then, the cunning fox had been, has been compelled to defend himself against the danger provoked by the man who began to damage nature. So in this way, the fox was forced to trickery and deceit in order to survive. He was compelled to take advantage of some actions achieved by the man who began destroying nature. He even dressed as a man in order to achieve his tricks. So let's say these relationships between the man and the fox and this um, um, a characteristic of be dressed as a man, as uh, Amalia Vargas pointed out in her narrative, and this um, um, a mythic tale in which uh, Horacio Castro explained the origin of uh, the um, uh, the why the fox was compelled to trickery. Uh, I dealt with this in another presentation, so I won't waste time in this. But this mythical tale was used by, by Horacio Castro in, in his repertoire when he told uh, a series of tales uh, um, dealing with the fox and the armadillo and the fox and the tiger and why the fox was uh, able to uh, deceit the tiger. And then he said, well, after having told all these tales, I will, uh, uh, I will tell you another tale explaining why the fox is um, compelled to, um, to trickery. So uh, in this um, moment, the, the main interest is, is to uh, speak about uh, this, um, about uh, this, please, the, the, the previous one. Well, the folks, uh, 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 the previous one, please. Yeah. So uh, he even dressed as a man in order to achieve these tricks. Next one, just as the folks are a metaphor of the uh, Quechua culture and interaction of animals and humans. The folks as a uh, the music uh, animal. Why the music? Because in other tales, for the fox even may, uh, was a sort of um, intermediate creature that uh, made, uh, sent message to the Pachamama and was uh, the one who, uh, a sort of mediator be between the these female goddess and men in um, certain opportunities. And there, these interactions about men and animals, all of them have been created by this female goddess, the Pachamama, who is in the vernacular cult cultures and earthly divinities. And she, he is compelled to survive by trickery in order to survive in a world commanded by the man who damaged nature. So let's go to the um, other one, to the next one. The second and um, the second tale of the repertoire of Amalia, Amalia Vargas is a donkey that or who, because it's personified, who she's silver. The protagonist of this story is the trickster Pedro Vimal. It is well known that Pedro de Mal is a famous trickster like the fox, and that, well, he is also a merchant who takes advantage of people going from one village to another in a quest of adventures. And it's also said that he had a donkey, a single donkey. So once he said, what am I going to do with this donkey, which is useless? So he decided, oh, well, I am going to sell it. I am going to tell the people that it is a magic donkey that cheats money. Here in the Quechua communities, one of our divinities is the Ekeko, the divinity of wealth. So this mixture between uh, a folk tale and um, social beliefs in the Ekeko, he, uh, she associated the divinity of wealth with, with this um, uh, will of uh, Pedro de Mal to uh, become wealthy. So Pedro de Mal put some silver in the ass of the don donkey. He put various bills as well as silver coins. And then he went to the fair to sell the donkey. That here in my town in of Western Argentina in the sound of the Andes, the mountains, there are many fairs where people used to go uh, to buy and sell goods. So he went to the fairs and he said, well, here I have a donkey, a donkey for sale, but this donkey is going to make you a millionaire. You have just to turn around in circles and you have to tell the donkey to shit money and he will do, do so. In our culture, the circular movement is very important. There are always circles called muyu. These circles reproduce the cycle of nature. Um, and uh, she makes also this association with the, this local worldview. And then he began saying, little donkey, please shit money, little donkey, please shit money. Then the nice donkey, 
sheet silver coins, but the donkey, uh, and he, he, he managed to sell this donkey to a, a man, and the, the man began to make circles like a fool, but when the, this, um, the buyer of, uh, took this uh, donkey to his house, he, uh, the donkey uh, uh, only dropped uh, dung. So it, he was tricked, all, always the possessor of the uh, pseudo magic um, object uh, become tricked. But the man, donkey, was, was it going to shit? Only done just that, my mother said. So let's go to the next uh, slide. It, the, mat, the, the thematic topic, topic is uh, also uh, AT uh, 1539, the uh, who, uh, who sells mag pseudo magic objects. In this case, the gold dropping horse, the composite structure is always to sequence, is selling the donkey and discovering the trick. The rhetoric construction is a comparison be between men and animals. The parody of the magic fu fu function of language is char charm, and the parody of magic folk. Taste. So these are uh, catalog under uh, ATU and Arne Thompson as uh, human uh, uh, jokes and, and anecdotes dealing with man and the, um, the man who is clever and uh, survives by trickery. So let's go to the inter uh, intertext with a ritual speech to the next slide in which we can make an intertextual connection with ritual speech the, um, I dealt in another presentation with other part of this uh, text of the Salamanca, which I collected in La Rioja in 1987. The Salamanca is the deal with the devil in, in, in a, this ceremony in which uh, whose um, distinctive features are the transformation. Those who don't um, achieve the deal with the devil, the devil used to transform them in uh, ugly animals, but there were always a, a um, transformation of beautiful or tasty um, goods or tasty things or beautiful uh, things into uh, waste or into ugly things. Uh, Alino Cordova says the Salamanca is a rite in, in which a man or a woman says their soul to the devil and the climax is the deal with the devil. Let's go to the next slide in which uh, in a meta-narrative close Marino Cordova says, what happens in the Salamanca is truth. It's a right that must be accomplished. But from this right, people find inspiration to tell both histories and stories. So uh, while the fictional tale and right uh, can be altern alternative itineraries of narrative ma matrices, uh, the tales are closer to the fictional domain, and the right is closer to social belief, and uh, this mixture of um, different narrative genres. So let's go to the next one. Uh, the intertext is a Salamanca by Marino Cordoba, this uh, in which uh, the narrator, uh, another narrator of the Mapuche culture says, Pedro Limam, which is the, um, the protagonist, is a personification of the fox in the Mapuche culture. This opposition between a beautiful appearance and a devil uh, essence and a tasty appearance of food in Donkey Dang. Just yesterday, a rascal was telling me that once he was returning home late at night and he arrived to a canyon and he heard music and was invited to dance. And so he danced and danced, he ate some tasty food and where he was about to return home, they gave him a parcel to take to his mother. He took the parcel and he returned home and the following day he woke up, he said, and he went to open the package and he realized that the tasty stuff had changed into donkey dung. And, it, uh, and he told it to his friends and his friends asked him, do you know where have you been in a Salamanca? So we made this intertextual connection, connection between tasty food um, uh, and transform into donkey dung and this uh, transformation, this uh, dynamics between uh, tasty goods and uh, ugly things and say that in their um, uh, background of social beliefs, this, uh, these transformations are part of the cultural background of people. So let's go to the uh, final part of this presentation, which has to be do with animal the audiovisual, uh, audiovisual recreation of animal tales in time of COVID-19. I gave to my students as a foreset this um, 
And this research I have done, and mainly the text by Horacio Castro, and they made a recreation in an audiovisual, uh, in a sort of TV new, new, uh, newscast circulating in YouTube. I will show you 30 seconds then of this presentation in which the fox as the president of Animalia Republic is giving instructions to the animal regarding how to take care of irresponsible humans in times of COVID-19, which require a strict lockdown. There is a, a sort of a dialogue between the um, TV, TV, uh, TV presenter, the TV host, who is a caterpillar, personified caterpillar, or who says, let's mean it, let's mean it, attention, our president will address the citizens of Animalia Republic from his country residence, the author. Uh, the, uh, our president Alberto Fernandez from her, his uh, country residence addressed the, us Argentinian citizens to um, in, give us instructions about uh, how the lockdown would uh, be and how uh, we about them the measures dealing with COVID. And the fox, as a personified, personified animal, says, "Dear citizens of Animalia." Our world has been attacked by the terrible pandemic of COVID-19, which is threatening our human pets. We humans as pets, let's take care of them. And then he says that uh, the human pets used to damage nature, as Horacio Castro said, and uh, that used to, um, uh, to be irresponsible. So it was the um, duty of the animals to take care about us humans. And the other intersex of the um, students were these news, um, pieces of news regarding animals that regain space when we humans were in lockdown, for instance, the dolphin of, of Venice um, swimming in the channels, on uh, the otters regaining the wetlands. And then unfortunately, the, when the lockdown flex, uh, became more flexible, the men fenced in, uh, the land. So the, um, and unfortunately, the otters were, um, died. But in this period, uh, she sa he said, he says also the person I feel holds. There was a legend telling that in the past humans uh, ruled the world and we animals were their pets. So this parody, uh, this um, fox as a clever animal teaching how to deal with silly humans, and this metaphor of Animalia Republic in the COVID-19 pandemic context. So let's go to the conclusion. To, uh, the, this itinerary through the Argentinian animal taste uh, revealed the permeability of folk narrative matrix toward contextual transformations dealing with belief narratives mirroring both vernacular worldviews and contemporary contextual changes as COVID-19. And this serious warning against the damage to the natural ecosystem provoked by human actions rooted in vernacular cultures. This animal were reflecting in folk to teach us how to take care of the environment to prevent global catastrophes such as the pandemic threats and uh, as well as earthquakes and other natural disasters, both local and global. All these preventions were um, mentioned in the um, discourse of the fox, of the person I felt fox in the, uh, this sort of parody my students made. So thank you for your attention. Let's go to the next slide. And I will, um, I would like to um, acknowledge Paulo Correa who made the prologue to uh, this uh, book uh, I managed to uh, finish, to Ulo Val, uh, to whom I addressed a question dealing with, uh, with his fantastic lecture, uh, lecture dealing with um, Estonian hell. And uh, he illuminated me be, um, thinking about Marino Cordova and how this uh, um, potter um, 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 managed to uh, put in a sort of ceramic folk tale uh, just these uh, folk beliefs because he himself was a collector of the uh, histories of his own. Um, of his own place of birth. And also to Miriam Mensei, who is uh, all, always uh, taking care of us and all these lectures, to Eva, whose uh, technical support was so, so uh, important to the Belief Narrative Network. And to all of you, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, really. Uh, and um, uh, thank you, really.